Welcome to Electron Line. Well, there's a third kind of star grouping. It's very different again from the other two. We had global clusters, we had open clusters. Now we have what we call stellar associations. And as the name indicates, they use the word association because they're not really tied together gravitationally. They only share a common time and place of origin. So when we have these star forming regions, such as inside the Orion Nebula or like inside M16 or in W5, you, what you'll find is that there's stars being formed at the same time and as they're starting to merge from the cloud and dust and gas from which they came, well, there's a group of stars there that just very recently formed and those are what we call stellar associations. They don't stay together very long because they're not gravitationally attracted to one another, they're too far apart from one another. The size of those stellar associations can be in the hundreds of light years and there's not that many stars so you simply don't have the gravitational attraction to form them into a permanent group. And then as the gravitational forces from the region around them start acting upon them, they slowly start drifting apart from one another and so they don't stay together very long. They're only there for a brief moment in time so to speak. Even if you think of a brief moment in time as several million years, as far as the universe is, is concerned, that is indeed a brief, brief moment in time. And then slowly they start getting pulled apart and you no longer see them as a grouping of stars together. So let's read some of the specifics. So stellar associations are very young and very loose groups of stars. Obviously, since they don't stick around very long, by definition, they're very young. Typically, they're within a million or a few million years from the moment that they were born. They share a common location and a common time of origin. And that's why they're called an association. They're not really a, a bound together by gravity. They just happen to be formed at the same time in the same location by a large cloud of dust and gas that's producing stars all at the same time. So then we can say they are not held together gravitationally. They are only a group of stars by appearance. So you look at them and go, there's a group of stars, but well, they're not going to be together for very long. It's like a, seeing a group of people that happen to be at the same place at the same time, but they're all walking away from each other. You go back a few minutes later, and they've all dispersed from one another. So that's kind of the same way, except instead of minutes, we're talking about a few million years. So they are indeed very bright objects. It turns out that most of these contain a lot of the, well, a lot, relatively speaking, a lot of very bright stars, the O and B type stars. They're very bright. They're very bright blue uh, giants on the main sequence. They give off enormous amount of light. So as a grouping, they are indeed very bright objects. They're among the brightest objects in the galaxy. So some of the stars, they have a luminosity that's equal to a million times the luminosity of the sun. Can you imagine a single star putting out as much light as a million suns? And if you have a dozen of those, you can imagine that's a grouping that is enormously bright. Even if not all of the stars are giving off that much light, as a group they do appear as a very, very bright object in the galaxy. They do have very short lifespans for two reasons. One of them is that if they're O and B type stars, they don't stay on the main sequence very long. But most likely before they even get a chance to make it through their lifespan as a main sequence star before they turn into red giants, they've already dispersed because of the gravitational attraction of other objects around them and they no longer appear as a grouping of stars together. The mass is typically several hundred times the mass of the sun. So if, even, even if you only have a dozen or 50 of the stars, on average, the mass of those stars is indeed larger than the mass of the sun. And the number of stars within one of those associations typically goes from tens to hundreds of stars. So if it's hundreds of stars, they are quite a bright bunch of stars. The average diameter of one of those associations is 250 light years. That's as large as the largest global cluster that has over 10 million stars in it. So you can imagine in the same volume, you only have a few dozen, 50 or 100 stars. And so therefore you could say that yes, they're much farther apart and the gravitational attraction simply isn't there. And after a few million years, the group members just simply disperse into the surroundings area. Oh, there we go. I'm missing an A. <laughs> it's like, what am I trying to say there? So yes, they just simply disperse into the, into the surrounding area and they're longer can then be considered as an association. So it's a different kind of grouping of stars. Interesting in their own right, but typically it's part of a star forming region and those of course are always of a tremendous interest to us, especially the beauty of the, of the molecular clouds and the gas clouds and the dust that we see, like we see in the Eagle Nebula M16, also known as the 
as the what we call pillars of creation where we actually can see stars in the, in, the, in the process of formation and solar systems in the process of formation. So um, where do they live? Well, in the case of the uh, M16, that's, I believe, about 6,000 or 10,000 light years away. But again, it's in the galactic disk. So in general, if you want to know where do they live, it's only in the galactic disk, it's in the areas where we have large molecular clouds like, like the Orion Nebula, the, uh, the Eagle Nebula, these dark massive clouds that have contained enormous amount of material out of which gravitationally can form new stars. So they're basically the star forming regions and particularly in the, in the, uh, the uh, galactic arms, the arms not the, not the core of the galaxy, galaxy. So in the galactic arms, that's where you find most of these, where the, the, the nebulas are bunched up together, forming high enough density to form stars. So they're not stars at all? These are not stars? The stellar association are the stars, but the regions, of course, where they're formed, those are these large, enormously large dust lanes where stars are being, being formed gravitationally. Yeah. So, so Young, young stars. They're all brand new stars. Some of them, of these associations, haven't even turned into stars yet. They're still t stars. Do they become stars in the open star cluster? The reason, so will they become open star clusters? And the answer, therefore, is no. So there's definitely three different types of clusters, and associations do not turn into open clusters. The reason for that is they're too far apart. Open clusters similarly are formed together, more or less, but they're formed much closer together. So it's like a very tight grouping where they're being formed, and because of that, they stay together gravitationally for up to a billion years or so. In this particular case, when the stars are formed, they're so far apart that they never really turn into a tight enough group to gravitation stay together. So that's the big difference between uh, open star clusters and stellar associations. Would they get very unlikely if you take a group of uh, 12 or 15 stars and as you asked, you know, do they get pulled together versus pulled apart? There's no mass to pull them together. You would need something on which they can anchor and be pulled together. So since there's no, not enough critical mass to pull the stars together, they won't get pulled together. They will simply get pulled apart. No, would they get pulled in, would a star get pulled into an open star cluster? That's true. Will a star get pulled into an open star cluster? Yes. If there's an open star cluster nearby and you have this association, the stars that are closest to the open cluster could potentially get pulled into the cluster because, again, there's a larger common mass there. But, again, open clusters also tend to get pulled apart because they're not tightly pulled together either. There's not enough of them. The, the mass isn't there. Open clusters tend to be relatively small, and so you don't get things pulled into them directly as much as you would see it if there was a global cluster nearby, things would get pulled in much more easily. Yeah, well, don't forget, we're talking about enormous distances. Things are very, very big in this universe, just in our galaxy alone, just an enormous large region of all kinds of strange things happening.